Welcome everyone. This is Laura Podolsky, and we are delighted that you joined us for today's webinar, Biking in Fresh Air, Consideration of Exposure to Traffic-Related Air Pollution and Bicycle Route Planning. This webinar is brought to you by the National Center for Sustainable Transportation. The National Center for Sustainable Transportation is one of five national centers designated by the U.S. Department of Transportation as part of their University Transportation Centers program. The center's mission is to advance a more sustainable transportation system through cutting-edge research, direct policy engagement, and education of our future leaders. The National Center is led by the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California, Davis, in partnership with the University of California, Riverside, University of Southern California, California State University, Long Beach, the University of Vermont, and Georgia Institute of Technology. Today's webinar will feature new research from the National Center, which was led by Kanuk Borabun Somsen and Jill Lua at the University of California, Riverside. For our time today, we'll start with a presentation from Kanuk and Jill, followed by comments and reflections from two special guest respondents. Nathan Mustafa, who's the Senior Traffic Engineer and Bicycle Coordinator at the City of Riverside, and Bill Nesper, who serves as the Executive Director of the League of American Bicyclists. We'll have plenty of time for questions from the audience, so I hope everyone came today with questions in mind. And if you would like to submit a question for our speaker or our guest respondent, or one of our guest respondents, then please type your question into the chat box located in the lower left hand of your screen. You can also use this chat box to let us know if you're running into any technical issues and we will do our best to help you. We will address all questions at the end of the presentation. So if you do have a question regarding a specific slide, then please note the number of that slide. We will also be recording today's webinar and posting it on our event page for later viewing. A link to the webinar, recording, today's slides, and associated reports will be sent to everyone in a follow-up email that will be going out hopefully later today. Now without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our speakers and distinguished guest respondents. Dr. Knuk Borabun Somsen is an Associate Research Engineer at the Center for Environmental Research and Technology, University of California, Riverside. His research interests include sustainable transportation systems and technologies, intelligent transportation systems, traffic simulation, traffic operations, transportation modeling, vehicle emissions modeling, and vehicle activity analysis. Jill Lua received a Ph. degree in environmental engineering from the University of California, Riverside in 2015, and she is currently an assistant specialist at the Center for Environmental Research and Technology at UC Riverside. Her research interests focus on intelligent transportation system strategies to mitigate human exposure to mobile source pollutants. This topic includes dispersion modeling of transportation emissions, inhalation exposure assessment, active transportation, and routing strategies to reduce pollution exposure to mobile source pollutants. We're also very excited to have Bill Nesper with us. He is the Executive Director of the League of American Bicyclists. Bill first joined the League in 2002 and brings a depth of knowledge of all of the League's programs and work throughout the country. Bill started the League as a membership assistant and since has directed the Smart Cycling and Bicycle Friendly America programs before taking on as the, as the Executive Director. We're also very excited to have Nathan Mustafa with us. He is a senior traffic engineer at the City of, River, of, City of Riverside and also serves as their bicycle coordinator. Before coming to the City of Riverside in 2013, Nathan worked as an engineer designer at Stantec. He has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the California State Polytechnic University, Pomona. And now without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Canuck. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today um, to present our work on uh, bicycle route planning that take into consideration uh, effect of uh, air pollution exposure. Um, just um, a little bit of uh, outline. Oh, by the way, today I'm uh, a little bit under the weather, so I'd like to 
apologize in advance uh, for my voice. Um, so today, uh, I will start off with some introductory slides, uh, providing context of the research and uh, pointing out the project objective. And then Jill will uh, walk you through um, the modeling side of the work uh, and then uh, the bicycle route planning tool, as well as how we use it in our case studies. And then uh, we will conclude with some concluding remarks and provide some future directions for uh, the research. Um, so as you all may know, uh, bicycling or biking is an active transportation mode with many benefits from mitigating congestion to foster or fostering livability and to promote public health. Now, on the other hand, um, bicyclists are vulnerable uh, road users and need protection. And, and by that, um, first of all, because um, they are at greater risk of being injured in traffic accident. Um, and what is less obvious is that uh, bicyclists are also directly exposed to vehicle exhaust and air toxic while they are traveling. And this is like, uh, in, in my analogy, is uh, secondhand smoking, right? Um, you do not produce uh, emissions, but you share the road with other travelers who do. Um, and also, it's worth noting that uh, during biking, your breathing rate is increased, and so you will inhale uh, the emission at a faster rate than normal. Now, uh, studies have shown that different bike routes have different levels of air pollution exposure. So maybe we can do something about this issue from the route planning perspective. And this is the motivation for this research. Um, to promote sustainable and multimodal transportation, uh, transportation agencies um, are trying to increase bicycle infrastructure uh, in many cases, uh, this new uh, infrastructure is created by um, adding bike lanes to existing rights of way. So factors that are typically considered when signing new bicycle routes include um, available rights of way, um, existing roadway infrastructure, um, terrain and road slope, uh, level of traffic or volume on the road, safety concern, and, and built environment. Now, um, the exposure of bicyclists to uh, traffic-related air pollution hasn't been looked at that much, and, and that's why we want to try to see in this research whether we can develop a method for considering that uh, factor uh, as part of the bicycle route planning process. Now, in order for us to compare um, air pollution exposure by bicyclists on different routes, uh, we first need to know the level of air pollution on those routes, but uh, that data is not currently available. Uh, as an example, this slide shows the map of air quality monitoring station in the, the region of Southern California Association of Governments. Um, these air quality monitoring stations are the ones that provide data for the calculation of air quality index that you uh, see on newspaper or online. Now, to put things in context, uh, the Skag region uh, covers over 38,000 square miles. And right now, there are only about 40 uh, air quality monitor uh, monitoring stations throughout the region. Um, that means oftentimes you get a single reading of air quality for the entire city, uh, as shown in the upper right picture as an example. Uh, that's uh, the area of city of Riverside, and you have one reading of air quality throughout the city. So the first step of our research is uh, to estimate the level of air pollutants uh, at the street level through a series of modeling. And I'm going to hand it over to Jill to walk you through how we did that.
Don't you? Oh, we cannot hear you. Hi, Jill, if you can, I'm, I'm sorry, everyone. This is Laura Podolsky. Jill, if you can send us your phone number, we need to unmute you. Canuck, would you be able to talk through some of these slides as we figure out how to get Jill online? Yes. All right. Uh, uh, sorry about um, the technical difficulty. But yes, in terms of modeling, um, first of all, um, I'd like to point out the scope of our modeling. Uh, we cannot, uh, because this is a, a pilot study, we cannot cover everything. So in terms of uh, pollutants, uh, we only focus on primary fine particles or PM2.5. That is uh, directly coming out of tailpipes. We do not look at secondary uh, particles. Um, and we only include emissions uh, from uh, uh, running exhaust, which means when the vehicle is running on the roadway. And we uh, analyze and, and model everything at the time resolution of one hour. Uh, we use a series of modeling, and, and each of the steps involves different modeling tools. Uh, for traffic model, um, Hello? we... Yes, is that you? Yes. Hi. Okay. Hi. By the way, I'm online. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, I'm going to hand over to Jill to continue the presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Kanak has introduced, um, because of the sparsely located monitor stations cannot provide sufficient pollutant data, we need to apply models to estimate the air pollution levels at the roadway and the neighborhood scale. Um, I think Kanak has uh, introduced the scope of the study, so uh, I'm going to talk a little about the case study area, which is the Riverside City. Uh, Riverside City is located 60 miles east of Los Angeles City in Southern California, and uh, Riverside City has a population of 320,000 population up to year 2016. Um, Riverside has a mix of hills and flatland, and a mix of CBD and low-density residential areas. As the state of California is advocating active transportation, Riverside City has made great efforts to make it friendly for active travelers. So the modeling chain applied in this study comes in four steps. First, a traffic model which estimates traffic activities based on the roadway network and the travel demand. The traffic activities include traffic volume, traffic speed, and what type of vehicles are there, for example, light-duty automobiles, light-duty trucks, uh, heavy-duty vehicles. Then the California emission model, MFAC 2014, was applied to estimate the aggregated traffic emission factor on roadways. Next, the EPA developed research-grade R-line dispersion model was used to predict the, pre the pollutant concentration, which were dispersed from the roadways. And we set up a 100 by 100 meter grid as virtual receptors and use the rear-side meteorolo meteorological parameters to model the concentration in and near Riverside City. Okay, next slide. Um, so this map shows the traffic volume estimated by the transportation model um, in, the mo in the morning period in Riverside City. The red line marked the roadways roadway links with the top 20% traffic volume. The state, the state Route 91 and the 60 freeway had the highest traffic volume up to 8,000 vehicles per hour. And the other red colored streets are local arterials, such as Van Buren Boulevard and Magnolia Avenue. The Riverside Transportation Model gave three scenarios for year 2017, morning, midday, and afternoon. Based on the three traffic scenarios, the weather parameters were grouped into three periods of day for 12 months in year 2017, which totals to 36 scenarios. Then the concentration of the tailpipe fine, fine particles for the 36 scenarios were modeled. Then next, 
the 36 scenarios concentration map were weighed network-wide based on the bicycle activities from extracted from the California Household Travel Survey to yield a weight fine particle concentration map. So here is a snapshot of the weight fine particle concentration map. The red points, which are the top 20% receptors with the highest fine particle concentrations, are located mostly within two miles from freeway 91 and 60. For major arterials, such as Van Buren and Arlington Avenue, the plume spread is approximately 30 meters. Especially, 95% of receptors uh, had a concentration under one microgram per cubic meter, which is a low level and it should not cause any acute health effects for healthy adults. Um, in this study, our goal is to develop a method for incorporating the consideration of exposure and potentially reduce this type of exposure for bicyclists as much as possible. So based on the previous concentration map, to access the air pollution inhalation, we adopt the concept inhaled mass based on several assumptions. The inhaled mass of air pollutant for a bicyclist traveling on a roadway link will be the product of the concentration of air pollutant on the roadway link, the time spent on the roadway link, and the breathing rate of the bicyclist. We extracted the concentration for each roadway link from the previous, the weight concentration map shown in the previous slide. The travel time was calculated by assuming the travel speed of an average bicyclist speed of nine miles per hour based on the GPS data site from the 2010 to 2012 California Household Travel Survey. The breathing rate was assumed to be 0.04 cubic meter per minute for an average bicyclist based on health studies. So with the, these parameters, we mapped the inhaled mass to each roadway link and normalized the inhaled mass with the length of the link. So in this map, we can see um, the red links represented the roadways with the top 20% inhaled particle mass per mile. Mm, for example, here, 0.05 microgram per uh, mile means that you will inhale 0.05 microgram of the fine particle if you travel on this link for a mile. In addition, we incorporated several critical map layers, including existing and planned bicycle facilities and bicycle-related traffic accidents. Planners and individual users can use this tool to select roadways which matches certain criteria. For example, one can filter the roadways with bicycle lanes, uh, which are under 0.05 microgram inhaled mass per mile. The next we chose the two circled areas as our case study um, areas. So the first case study, uh, in the first case study, we took a look at the corridors which connect UC Riverside to downtown Riverside. Uh, these are two popular trip origins and destinations, and there are potentially many bicycle trips between the two places. In the map, the pink stick lines mark the class two bicycle lane that are already built, and the gray stick line marks the bicycle lanes that are planned for the future. We're looking at the three corridors. First, the pink, the pink pair of dots label the third street, the blue dots label the Mission Inn Avenue, and the red dots label the University Avenue. Uh, there is already a bicycle lane built on the third avenue and we selected for references purposes. The University Avenue section is where the planned bicycle lane will be placed in the future. And we wonder how does Mission Inn Avenue compare with University Avenue. Here are two Google Street images of the Mission Inn Avenue and the University Avenue. We use the street images to collect the detailed roadway factors, for example, the roadway parking information, uh, road shooter ways, and the number of lanes, uh, etc. So based on the observations, we have listed the following attributes for the three roads. 
the three roles are quite different from each other, and the attributes uh, with a big difference are highlighted in blue squares. For example, the third street surrounding is a mix of residential and the industry zones. And for Mission Inn Avenue, it is a mix of residential and business zones. Uh, and the University Avenue is mostly connected with businesses and the commercial zones. As for barriers, there are train tracks going across 3rd Street and Mission Inn Avenue, and this makes University Avenue more favorable than others. However, for speed limit, Mission Inn Avenue has the lowest speed limit, and the University Avenue has the highest speed limit. The total PM2.5 inhaled mass which is a very important factor we're looking at in this study for the three sections are 0 0.9, um, 0 0.11, and 0 0.14 mi microgram, uh, respectively. These are two attributes. Um, these two attributes make Third Street and Mission Inn Avenue better than the University Avenue in terms of tailpipe emission exposure. Um, just to give a uh, comparison, a 15-minute bicycle uh, trip in a 12 microgram per cubic meter ambient air quality will result in a 7 microgram of inhaled particle mass. So um, this value will not likely cause any acute health effects for healthy adults. Uh, the, the effects for sensitive populations such as children and asthma patients however, are not that predictable. Again, our goal is to potentially uh, reduce the tailpipe emission exposure on the basis of promoting bicycle and active transportation. Okay, so next, we will weigh each of the attributes for the three street sections. The weight of importance marks how important the factor is. For example, 10 means the most important. Uh, in addition, we signed a rank for each of the street section. Um, for example, for posted speed limit, Mission Inn is the lowest and University is the highest. Therefore, we think Mission, Mission Inn Avenue is the best in terms of a safe speed limit, and we gave Mission Inn Avenue rank number one. On the other hand, the University Avenue section has the highest speed limit, so we gave it a rank number three. And Mission Inn Avenue, uh, and the third street is in the middle, so we gave it a rank number two. For road grade, uh, there is a rank 1.5, uh, which means third street and the Mission Inn Avenue rank the same in the first and second place, and the rank will be average of will be the average of one and two, which is 1.5. So the weight of importance and attribute ranks should reflect the local knowledge and the preferences. With the values in the table, we are able to test how the change of the exposure value will impact the overall ranking of the three sections. In this figure, the x-axis shows the weight of importance for the exposure attribute, and the 10 means giving the exposure attribute the most important weight. The lower the y-axis value is, the higher the rank is. We can see that the University Avenue is the best when not considering air pollutant exposure value at all, or giving it the lowest weight. As the weight increases, the Mission Inn becomes a better choice, and the third street is in an overall very good rank. Therefore, the weight of the importance will largely impact the rankings and it serves as a reference of what factors need to be improved for one street. For example, if the VMT on the University Avenue can be largely reduced the, and the air quality could be improved, then University will be a good street for the future bicycle facility. And now let, let's go to the case study number two. Uh, this case study is around the Van Buren Boulevard area in the south of Riverside City. The study area has dense residential housing, schools, and there are many roadway intersections within a street block. In the map, similarly, the pink stick lines mark the class two bicycle lane that are already built, and the gray lines mark the bicycle lanes that are planned for the future. 
There are two miles of bicycle lanes planned on Van Buren Boulevard, labeled by a pair of red dots, and the parallel crime area of the street, which are marked with a pair of dark blue dots, will be compared with the Van Buren Boulevard section. Again, we turn to the Google Street View for the details of the road attributes. Uh, this section of Van Buren Boulevard is an artery in the city, mostly connected with commercial zones, and the crime area is the residential zone road. Um, from the images, we can see that the attributes are quite different between the two road sections. For example, Van Buren speed limit is up to 50 miles per hour, and the crime area has a speed limit of 25. Um, while Van Buren is connected with more amenities, such as restaurants and stores, the traffic volume on it is also three times more than that on Cromaria Street. On the other hand, Cromaria are connected with more small residential roads and potentially more set traffic from those roads. Therefore, in terms of um, number of intersections along the segment, um, the Van Buren section ranked higher than the Cromaria Avenue. Uh, as for the inhaled mass value, the Van Buren section uh, is 1.8 times higher than that of Cromaria Avenue. So here we rank the two sections uh, based on our previous rules, and the next way we will increase the weight for the inhaled mass value and uh, uh, see how the how it will influence the ranking results. As we can see in the figure, Van Buren Boulevard is better when not considering air pollution exposure, and the Cromaria Avenue is better when giving different weight to the exposure factor. Okay, now I'll turn it to Kinnock. Thank you, Jill. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to wrap up with some concluding remarks, um, uh, the key takeaways from this research. Um, the first one is that uh, the current spatial resolution of the existing air quality measurement data is not yet adequate for bicycle route planning. And I said not yet because uh, more data should, be, should become available in the near future uh, with the uh, emerging of low-cost air quality sensors and programs such as AB 617 communica uh, Community Air Protection Program uh, in California. And um, the second takeaway is that uh, traffic volume alone is not a sufficient surrogate for the level of traffic-related air pollution on the road uh, because um, the level of air pollution also depends on other factors, uh, including congestion level, uh, vehicle types, uh, weather pattern, uh, road grade, and also proximity to roads with uh, heavy traffic and others. Um, the next one is that um, there are many factors that are traditionally considered when planning bicycle routes, and this research demonstrates how uh, bicyclist exposure to traffic-related air pollution can also be included in the considerations. Now, the weight of importance for the different considerations uh, will have impact on the outcome of the bicycle route planning as we show in the two case studies. Now, um, this weight um, will likely be different for the different cities or areas uh, because they should reflect, uh, like you said, local knowledge and preference. Uh, as an example, uh, in areas where air quality is a major problem, uh, maybe the air pollution exposure factor uh, could be given a higher weight, right? Because 10-20% uh, of exposure could tip a balance from healthy air to unhealthy. In terms of um, future direction uh, for this research, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we included only a specific uh, pollutant in this study. Um, so in the future, it uh, would be uh, helpful to also uh, include other sources of emissions and also background concentrations. And um, we assume, uh, we make uh, quite a few assumptions in terms of the biking speed and breathing rate. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, these will vary by demographic groups. 
So those variables can be something that uh, be customized to specific demographic groups, whether it be uh, school age children or uh, general population. And then again, uh, once the data, uh, the measurement data uh, from near road uh, air quality sensors become uh, more available, then uh, we can use uh, the actual measurement data in place of uh, the model uh, data uh, in the determination of the impact of exposure on bicyclists. And um, I would like to uh, uh, wrap up by acknowledging um, several uh, organizations and people um, from funding. Uh, NCST is uh, the prime sponsor of this research uh, through funding from USDOT and Caltrans. And uh, we have several project panel members that provide um, useful and critical inputs to the research. And we also uh, receive uh, general support and local input from uh, Nathan from City of Riverside. Thank you for your attention, and um, this concludes the con presentation. Thank you, Kanuk and Jill. This is Laura again. And I'm really excited to hear from our guest respondents commenting to the work that Jill and Kanuk um, just presented on. So first, I might point to Nathan Mustafa with the city of Riverside to provide his comments and reflection about the, the work just presented. Uh, Nathan? Sure, thank you. Uh, I want to start by saying that we're very fortunate and thankful to have partners like Canuck and Jill at UCR Center for Environmental Research here in Riverside and that you know we've been able to retain some of that talent to put towards uh, working at issues here in our own region. Um, some of the the thoughts raised in this study aren't part of how we traditionally plan for bike routes uh, as an industry in the city uh, and just in general. When you look at arterial roadways, uh, it's part of the consideration is, of course, the high volume of cars. And as Canuck mentioned, there, there is a significant correlation between the number of cars on the roadway and some of the dangers associated with the inhalation of particulate matters. And those are also correlated to dangers of collisions uh, and other incidents that occur on high volume roadways. But those are typically mitigated through the construction of something like a class one or a class four bike lane so that we can continue to provide access to some of the land uses on those high volume routes. Whereas this study would suggest that depending on how we ultimately view and weigh some of the, the air quality and health hazards in our research and our, and our planning efforts, the construction of a separated bikeway may not be sufficient to mitigate all of some of the true safety concerns that can happen alongside these roadways. Um, this is a particularly important issue for our region in the Inland Empire because of our geography and because we serve as kind of a gateway for a lot of the goods movement towards the rest of the country. Uh, it's also not part of how we educate our young riders right now. We talk about safe riding practices. We don't really educate them on some of the dangers of uh, inhaling particular matters. And of course, it's, it's on us to look towards mitigating that because that's not something that someone is normally going to think of. As Canuck mentioned, it's invisible. Um, you know, it, it presents a challenge with us uh, because one of the case studies that Canuck highlighted today was University Avenue. And University has been designated as an innovation corridor uh, by our city council and mayor as part of a larger innovation district uh, where we're going to be trying to drive economic growth uh, and bringing in high-tech businesses into the city centered around this innovation corridor where we're going to provide the highest quality of mobility uh, and other services from our city. But this research suggests that the scales are very finely balanced uh, on University Avenue in terms of air quality. And so that as we encourage that growth, we have to be very mindful of some of the, the new guidance issued by the state, particularly related to vehicle miles traveled and the mitigation of vehicles on the roadway to help keep the scales tipped in our balance and potentially uh, reduce the emissions uh, inhaled by bicyclists on University Avenue. So that's something that we're now going to be very mindful of as we move forward with the planning of that corridor and how we site 
certain land uses along it. Um, you know, UCR's findings also um, are going to be important as we develop our active transportation master plan this year and our complete streets ordinance. And I'm really looking forward to applying some of the, the data and the practices piloted here by UCR as we lay out the framework for mobility in our city. Uh, and again, uh, very thankful for the research that Canuck and Jill have done here. Thank you so much, Nathan. And Bill, I think we're gonna unmute you here very quickly. And if you could provide a national perspective for us and really how you see the integration of air pollution or traffic related air pollution being um, more integrated into bicycle route planning. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, so, so at our work uh, at the League of American Bicyclists, you know, we're, we're one of the ways we're trying to um, help communities uh, apply better policies and programs is through our bicycle friendly community program. So uh, Riverside being a bronze level bicycle friendly community in one of 450 bicycle friendly communities around the country, you know, working towards that diamond level. Um, it's good to see that a practitioner like Nathan is uh, seeing this as an additional uh, a tool in the toolbox. I think planners um, around the country, uh, it'll be great to have this. Um, you know, our, our mission is to make uh, um, a bicycle friendly America for everyone. And so for the league and from this national perspective, I think make it, that means making bicycling safe, comfortable and convenient for all. And so when I, when it's, it's, it's great to hear um, how this will uh, be part of the planning toolbox. I think one thing when, when thinking about how we plan uh, for for uh, better bicycling infrastructure, um, uh, that we're that the weighting of these factors. I was really glad to hear that local knowledge is going to be in there, but the weighting of these factors is going to be really key. Um, without having clear data on the uh, the negative uh, consequences of uh, exercising, riding uh, in uh, places where there are increased particulate matter, um, without really knowing the negative effects there, it's it's it's. Um, I think I would opt for prioritizing making bicycling routes to more destinations that are safe and comfortable and convenient for for as many people as possible. And I think you know, folks probably share share that desire as well. Um, yeah, and then given the history of uh, bike route planning, you know, I think that it makes sense. To get this right, uh, and 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 I think to to blur the lines between bicycling as recreation and bicycling as transportation. So you know, as we are developing these these great centers, like we just heard, um, you know, we're we're creating great places. Uh, it's important that um, people can have uh, a great choice to get around, to recreate, to get to the places that they want to go. We know that trips aren't usually recreation trips or just transportation trips. So I, I think I think there's a, there's a lot of things that go into uh, you know uh, those trips that we do. So so again, making those safe and comfortable and convenient uh, as possible. Um, yeah. So 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 knowing what the what the uh, no, having better collection of this data, and and really knowing the negative effects. Um, I think you know it's important to note that um, at least from from other studies that I've seen that. You know the, the risks of not biking or exercising uh, greatly uh, outweighs the risks of uh, taking in particulate matter uh, it, in all but maybe one to two percent of cities around the globe. So that's just something j just on the other side of that scale. But I think that's it from my from, from my perspective. Thanks for this great research from Canuck and, and Jill. Really excited to be a part of this. And thanks again for the National Center for inviting me. Great, thank you, Bill. This is Laura again, and I think your points on the weighting and, and choosing how much you weight these different factors is a good one. And I might throw out a first question um, to both the, the speakers, um, as well as Nathan, on how um, did you all discuss the weighting and, and how to balance that with the others, or was this just a, um, the research more of just looking at the effect of weighting as you increase the weight for exposure? Hello. Hi. Hi. I think I can answer this question. Uh, so we have discussed with uh, Nathan uh, regarding the uh, different attributes of the study areas. Um, however, in this study, we did focus more on the exposure side and uh, focus more on how the exposure, the weight of importance of exposure changes 
and uh, how uh, and how the ranking results will change. Yeah, that's our main focus of the study. And then Nathan, did you want to add anything to that from your perspective as a practitioner in regards to the weighting and balancing of the different considerations? Sure, I, I think that it's important that they included the entire range uh, of uh, that weight scale just to show the impact of how heavily we weigh the inhalation of particulate matters. Uh, you know, from my standpoint, I'm also looking at things like multimodal level of service along these routes uh, at the, um, the data from our, our police team uh, as far as collisions, which they did account for as well as part of their study. Um, but we also look at things when we're applying for funds through uh, state funding sources such as the Active Transportation Program that have uh, specific criteria for um, funding that uh, don't really include necessarily uh, this data, but as part of the um, environmental screening process for those projects, we, we do consider it, just not in the way that uh, Jill and Canuck have done here. Um, and so I, I was happy that they included the range, and like Bill has mentioned, you know, it, it does remain to be seen um, how exactly we can directly weight the health risks of particular matter in, inhalation in these volumes against some of the other safety concerns that might be experienced along high volume roadways. Great, thank you. Now I want to turn to some questions that we received from the participants today. One is first just asking about the breathing rate and how that was estimated. Um, I know that I believe it was slide 11, which I will go to. And um, Jill, if you could just go over this one more time. And, and then the person who submitted this question also asked about how do you take in account uh, males, females, age group, body mass. And I think that was Canuck at the very end was saying as a next step, um, you know, figuring out how to better reflect uh, the breathing rate of different um, demographic groups. But if you, Jill, could just go over the slide again on how you came up with the breathing rate, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so the breathing rate was... Uh, health study uh, results we extracted from previous references. And I think your point is very good that we should customize it for different uh, gender and age groups. And uh, for this step, we generalize, we generalize it to be 0 0.04 uh, cubic meter per minute, mainly because that here we want to average it for uh, all the bicycle users. Uh, because once the facility was built, uh, you cannot be easily moved. So we want to generalize it first. And then I think after we had all this uh, concentration and exposure map, and when we customize the route for specific users, we should consider their own uh, breathing rate and their own travel speed uh, based on their uh, demographic group. Okay, that's, my, that's my answer. Great, thank you, Jill. And another question came in uh, similar about the, the health impacts of exposure. So, and I think you mentioned this a little bit before, but if you could um, mention it again or maybe expand is how, what level of exposure, what level of exposure to the PM2.5 impacts health? So, and I believe you provided an example, you know, if you're traveling for a 15-minute bike ride, mm -hmm. um, you, you will be exposed to this level of PM, and that might not be bad for the general population, but for children and those with asthma, it may. So could you just talk about that a little bit more? Okay. Uh, so this value we referenced it f um, from the, uh, I think it's California Ambient Air Quality Standard. Um, if I didn't remember it wrong, the 24-hour average for fine particle concentration is uh, 12 microgram per cubic meter. Um, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, so with that, as uh, a ambient uh, air pollutant concentration, 12 microgram per cubic meter, uh, bicycle for 15 minutes with the brazing rate uh, 0.04 uh, cube per minute that we introduced before, it will result into uh, seven microgram uh, inhaled particle mass. So that's how we uh, calculate and reference the air quality standard. Okay, great, thank you. Another question that came in was talking about your the, the ranking table. 
And so one, one thing that this, the question points out is that there's a factor for the number of lanes, and that was much higher, that the scores were much higher for the number of lanes, um, wait, excuse me, the scores were such that a higher number of lanes was better, and the, 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 resp uh, the respondent or the, the participant wanted to know if you could explain um, why this is. Okay, yes. Uh, so I know it's kind of contradictory to the traffic volume because more lanes will lead to more traffic volume. Uh, however, we're considering that more lanes means that the road is wider and there will be potentially more space for the future bicycle lane. Also, more lanes um, also means that there is a poss poss uh, potential uh, uh, there's a possibility to go on for a road diet for uh, the specific road if uh, we need to put on the bicycle lane. Uh, for example, for a road with only one lane in one direction and versus three lanes in one di direction, I think the three lane road uh, are more likely to have uh, you know, more space for the potential and the future bicycle facility. Great, thank you, Jill. Another question came in about the ranking as well, and this is more of a question of, did you take into consideration the percentage of truck, truck traffic? Um, actually, we didn't take the truck traffic as a consideration in this study. Um, it is kind of reflected in the exposure, uh, in the exposure level because um, one truck can generate uh, the emission of uh, probably 200 uh, light duty automobile. So um, the total PM 2.5 exposure reflected, uh, I should say, yeah, we, we didn't consider the truck volume in this study. Uh, we only considered the total volume here. Thank you. And just, just to um, add on to the answer, yeah, basically, when you track traffic, if, if you look at from safety perspective, that's not directly uh, included as a factor, but from the exposure perspective, yes, uh, truck traffic is used uh, to calculate PM 2.5 emission levels that also reflected in the exposure numbers. Thank you, Kanek. So we had another question um, come in to, if, uh, for our, our presenters, if to explain why the traffic volume is not sufficient proxy for pollution. Yes, um, so to answer that one, I would like to go to slide number 10. So yeah, in this slide, uh, it showed the weighted uh, particle concentration map. And uh, in the city of Riverside, we have two major freeway, which is uh, 60 and then uh, 91 and if you take 60 an example um, of course a freeway has a lot of traffic but if you look at um, north of 60 um, so because the wind blow down from northeast so any road that is I'm sorry not north but south of 60 even though minor road that are south of 60 but are close to 60 would have high level of concentration, even though uh, the traffic on those roads may not be as high. Okay, great, thank you. Another question that we have come in is to discuss the spatial resolution. Um, and is it fine enough to really understand the exposure difference between two streets that are parallel and only a block apart? Or if you could comment on that. Yes, so the, the, the answer is yes. Um, so uh, on this slide, as an example, uh, we have uh, two options, uh, which is University Avenue and Mission Inn Avenue, which are yeah, exactly one block apart. And the resolution of our air pollution map is created from having virtual receptors of 100 meter by 100 meter grids. And the level of air pollution at any point can be uh, interpolated. So um, yeah, we can use that map to interpolate 
and determine the level of air pollution uh, at any location on the map. But uh, I'd like to point out that you know, everything is limited to the ability of the model to, uh, to estimate the level of uh, air pollution dispersion. So uh, at that fine level detail, um, it would be better in the future if you can have measurement data uh, from each street directly. Great, thank you. And another question was that they were curious if the link is very long that you were, were looking at in your case studies, did you consider the concentration variation along the link and increase concentration near intersections? Yes, the answer is yes. So um, on slide that we talk about. Um, 11. Yes, on slide 11. So the concentration that we use in the calculation of exposure is the average of at least three points on each link, uh, the start, the middle, and the end of the links. So uh, if the link is longer, we can sample more points in the calculation of the average concentration. Uh, in terms of concentration at intersection, uh, the answer is also yes, because um, if we take one of the points right at the intersection, uh, the higher concentration there will be reflected. Fantastic. So we have one other question that's come in. So what consideration is given to taking measures to reduce traffic volumes as a strategy instead of just shifting bicycle traffic to a different corridor? I, I mean, I, I can speak to that. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned when, when I was res responding to the presentation in general that, you know, the case study did show that University Avenue was not the most desirable route to take with respect to particulate matters. Uh, and uh, because we want that to be the corridor where we are providing, you know, higher than average quality mobility services, bike share, uh, you know, in protected bike lanes, and uh, connected vehicle uh, infrastructure at our signalized intersections, uh, that really, uh, in, instead of saying, well, we need to look at another roadway, that means that as we plan out our innovation district and as we approve land uses and, uh, and new buildings within that area, we need to look at how do we mitigate the VMT, uh, and how do we use uh, the improvements we would like to make for alternative transportation to help reduce uh, the VMT on the roadways and help bring that uh, inhalation level down. Um, so, you know, it, it's more of a call to action on that particular route as opposed to simply just shifting um, bikes because we want to prioritize vehicles on that corridor. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was a great question and a great answer. So I don't, we don't have any other questions that have come in from our audience, so I'll just take this moment to um, thank our guest respondents today, Bill Nesper with the League of American Bicyclists, and Nathan Mustafa, again, with the City of Riverside. We thank you so much for joining us today and providing your comments. And a special thank you to Jill Lua and Kanuk Borabunsomsen. Bor 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 there it is. <laughs> Second try. Um, and I also want to remind everyone that we will be sending out an email later today that will have a link to the recorded webinar as well as to the slides and to a link to download the recent report that captures everything that Jill and Kanuk talked about today um, and with even more detail. So thank you again. Um, and I'm going to actually put this last slide up here with Jill and Kanuk's uh, contact information. You know, please don't hesitate to reach out with them if there are additional questions or ideas for what they could be looking at as they uh, look to the next stages of this type of research. So on behalf of the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, thank you, and we look forward to engaging you in future webinars. Thank you.